And now I move on to Simon Dingle. Simon is the CEO of Invest Capital South Africa, and he's also a radio presenter. He's going to speak to us on a topic that reads, there has been only one. Do I just need to shout? I'm unfortunately, I can't stand at the lectern. Um, I am half Italian, and you know how you shut an Italian up? You tie their hands together. In my case, I, I can't stand still. All right, we've got a mic. Yay. Good morning. Thank you very much. Now we just need slides. Can we get those two? Us because we are over time already. There we go. Okay, I'll just jump straight into it. Uh, in 2017, I almost said last year, uh, because my brain still hasn't kicked into the fact that we're 20% of the way through 2019. But in 2017, the French car manufacturer Renault ran a design competition. They went out to the world of designers and they said, we'd like you to conceptualize what cars could look like in the year 2020. Uh, futurists love round numbers, and the year 2020, of course, has been a focal point for them since about 1950. <laughs> and they've all been fantasizing. First it was the year 2000, um, that turned out to be a bit of a non-event. And then it became 2020, as sort of this pinnacle of when all these new innovations would come to light. And so Renault went out to the world of designers, and they said, design us a car, imagine these things being on the roads in 2020. And the one constriction is that you have to imagine this car being made with technology that already exists today. So you can't have a car that turns into a ham sandwich halfway as it's flying to the moon. It has to actually be built out of technology that's viable today. And I won that competition. No, I, I didn't. I, I'm glad somebody was laughing, right? I, I bet at least one of you in the audience was like, oh, shit. Um, no, I didn't win the competition. But somebody did win that competition, and they came up with a design for a car that looks nothing like the automobiles that we are used to. Now, the amazing thing about this potential Renault of the year 2020 uh, is firstly that it drives itself. No big surprises there. We already know that artificial intelligence is are able to uh, drive better than any human being alive, including Formula One drivers. That's just uh, kind of not even an argument anymore. Um, it's also made out of a plexiglass exterior, and these cards magnetically bolt together as they fly down the highway. That's a safety feature, because if all the cars are gobbed together, then they're not going to crash into each other. And they also imagined that you could have different cars for different purposes. So maybe you've got a two-hour commute, and you book the cinema car so you can watch the latest movie while you're going to work, or you could book the meeting car, and you could have a meeting while you're on your way. There's a gym car with a cycling apparatus inside of it, so you can get fit as you're hurtling down the highway. It's fantastic. But of course, I'm ignoring the single most sort of defining thing about this vehicle, and that is that it's floating off of the frickin' road. Now, remember what I told you before, this thing had to be imagined with technology that exists today, and that technology does exist. It's called magnetic levitation, or maglev. Uh, it's been used in bullet trains in Japan for a very long time. They actually hover above the rails. But to make this work for a car, we would have to rip up all the roads of the world and put magnets underneath them, massive electromagnets. And that is why, despite this being an awesome design, we are never going to have this car. Renault is never going to make it. Not because it's not technologically possible, it is, but because it's unfeasible. And can you imagine being one of these cars when you arrive at your friend's house for a braai and he's got a gravel driveway without a magnet under it? <laughs> All of a sudden, your new Renault isn't so slim anymore. So we're not going to see it, and I want to start my talk this morning with that point, is we tend to get enamored with technology and the possibilities that it brings to us, and we forget that without the human stories and appreciating the practical uses of it and what it means to actually implement this technology, the fact that it can do all of these things almost ceases to matter. To further illustrate my point, I want to play a quick game called Count the Squares. I'm going to show you an image, and I want you to count all of the squares in this image. It's quite a daunting task. <laughs> There are many, many squares in this image. But count as many as you can and stop about there, and you'll probably have a number in your head. You can shout them out. 16. All right, I want to switch now to counting the circles. Could you count the circles in that image? Has anybody seen the circles yet? Did anybody see the circles first? There's a circle. Ah, oh, damn, what just happened in your brain? Right, who saw the circles first? There you go. Um, maybe you should be stepping into government next. <laughs> I hear there's some vacancies coming up. Um, 
But this is a very simple example of how bad human beings can be at processing information. And also at how bad we are between switching between what we know and how to action on that. You all now know, hopefully, has anybody still not seen the circles? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're there, I promise you. Um, but you know there are both circles and squares on this image. The problem is you cannot see them both at the same time. It is literally impossible for your optical system in your brain to see both the circles and the squares at the same time. You have to literally switch between the two. And it's kind of crazy when you do it. It is literally a switch flipping in your brain, going between squares and circles. Knowing that they're both there doesn't mean that you're going to see them. We are notoriously bad at taking information, processing it, and using it to make decisions, despite the fact that we say things like seeing is believing, which it absolutely is not. And as technologists, it's so important to remember this. There are behavioral differences, cultural nuances. Um, there are severe limitations in the way that human beings process and perceive information, and almost none of them have to do with how cool the technology is in the product that you're presenting to them. Because since the dawn of technology, which really goes back to us sharpening sticks and stones, all that's mattered to people is the story they can tell around the technologies that are being presented to them, not the technology itself. We literally have found examples of sharpened stone axes from Africa's East Rift Valley, right? Where Homo erectus were making these things for millions of years in sizes that ranged from literally like the size of a thumbnail to six feet high. So what do you do with a six-foot-high axe head? Anthropologists didn't know. They realized, though, that what Homo erectus was probably do doing was honing a craft, developing a story, looking not just at what the technology is and what it's capable of, but what it means for them. What is the story that the technology enables? And it's those stories that win. It's never the best technology that wins. There are several examples of this. We all know about Betamax and VHS, yes? Sorry, some of you are younger than 30. So, in the olden day, children, we used to have big plastic boxes that we put movies inside. It's kind of like magic. It worked with magnetism. And then you would go to a shop where they had lots of these plastic boxes, and you would take it home, and you'd put it into another plastic box, and you'd watch a movie. It wasn't quite as good as Netflix, right? But there were two standards for these plastic boxes, VHS and Betamax. And without getting into it, because we're already out, almost out of time, uh, VHS was... a was not the best uh, standard for this. Betamax was the best standard, but VHS won because it had a better story to tell. For one, VHS machines uh, were the first to have wireless remotes that didn't require a cable dangling through the lounge. Uh, VHS was cheaper as well. The technology wasn't as good, but it was good enough. It was the story that won the day. And human stories define the world around us, even though they have no bearing on objective reality. We think we know what the world looks like. We know for a fact that it's round. We don't have any flat earthers in the crowd, hey? There's a very good uh, documentary on Netflix called Beyond the Curve, which I highly recommend. But I actually signed up for their newsletter. The Flat Earthers have a newsletter. And I got one a few weeks ago that said, people all around the globe are joining our movement. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we know the earth is round, but we have some very strange ideas about what it looks like. We all grew up with maps like this on the walls of our classroom at school. And this is absolutely not what the Earth looks like in objective rea reality. Firstly, this is a Eurocentric map. We call it that because Europe's at the center. Uh, and surprise, surprise, Europe's at the center because the people who drew these maps came from there. They started traveling around the world, learning that it didn't have dragons in the middle of the sea, that it wasn't, in fact, flat. But they started drawing the world around the place they knew in Europe. They decided that north was up and south was down, even though there's no up and down in space. And they drew the map accordingly, and now when things aren't going so well, we say they're going south. Although I suspect that's going to be a little bit different over the next 20 years, because we have a sentient Nazi in charge of the most powerful office in the solar system. But some people have challenged this notion of the world, this view of the world, right? Uh, there's a company that started selling the upside-down map. Richard Dawkins made this map famous in The God Delusion because he said this is a consciousness-raising experiment. When you look at this map, it's every bit as accurate as the Eurocentric map. You could navigate with this map and get to exactly where you were going, but it challenges this idea that there's an up or down in space because, of course, there isn't. Any guesses where this company is stationed? Australia. <laughs> at the top in the middle. It's a very interesting view of the world, but it's not my favorite. My favorite map was drawn up by Buckminster Fuller in the 1950s. Uh, go and read about him on Wikipedia, because I don't have time to get into that uh, magnificent mind's background. 
But he said, what if we took the map and we literally didn't change anything about it, we just unpacked it differently. Let's look at the world from the top down, so to speak, and let's unpack the map in a different way visually. The interesting thing about the Buckminster Fuller map is that there are no gaps between all of the land masses that make up our different continents. So when you grow up with a Eurocentric view of the world, you have this notion that there's vast swathes of ocean in between the land masses and that our people are separated by this and that these land masses are somehow very distant and separate from each other. When you look at the Buckminster Fuller map, you get a more representative picture of the fact that the land masses are actually all connected, sometimes only temporarily by ice sheets. But try to imagine what your view of the world would have been like if you had grown with the, up with this map on the wall instead of the Eurocentric map. Perhaps we wouldn't perceive people from distant lands as A, being so distant to begin with, and maybe we wouldn't think they were so different from us. We could also start to imagine things like subway systems that actually connected this all together. And we could do away with some of the imaginary borders that we have. By the way, a subway system like that has actually been designed um, using Hyperloop technology, another thing that's technologically possible, but which we unfortunately probably will never see. It doesn't matter that that view of reality doesn't align to objective reality, we still use it to run our lives to punish people for crossing imaginary borders they weren't supposed to, and for imposing monetary systems on them that make no sense when you start to inject a little bit of objective reality into the story. To ridiculous extents, right? So in 1974, King Ramses II of Egypt was having a bit of a shit year. I mean, he'd be dead for 3,000 years, so it wasn't great to begin with, but he was starting to rot. He was lying in the um, Egyptian museum in Cairo, and too much moisture had been allowed into the room where he was lying, and so he was pretty fraught already, but he was starting to rot even more. And the Egyptologists who were looking after him thought that they better do something to save him. So they went around the world and they tried to find a mummification expert or team of experts who could take the corpse of King Ramses II and restore it. I would say to its former glory, but let's be honest, he didn't look that great to begin with. Um, and eventually they found a team in France that was able to do this, the university in Paris. Who knew, right? <laughs> the French, they're good for so many things. And they phoned them up and they said, well, our pharaoh's busy rotting, could we please send him to you in France and could you restore him? And the French said, well, yes, of course we can do this thing, but uh, does he have a passport? Sorry, that's somewhere between Swahili and Portuguese. It's my best approximation of French, okay? But they would not allow King Ramses II to travel to France without a passport because under French law, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're alive or dead, you will have a passport. And so the Egyptian government had to issue him one, right? <laughs> And so somebody who had been dead for 3,000 years, and a lot had happened to him during this time, now had to be issued a passport so that he could travel to France and be prevented from rotting anymore. Because, God damn it, governments make a lot of sense when they start implying the rationalities around our physical borders to the real world. So that's very amusing. But there's an important point behind it. The point is that these rules, these systems, these borders, these maps, these views of the world are up for debate. They have no bearing in objective reality. You want to change them? Fine. All you need is enough people to come along for the ride. Because stories are just games that we play. And every game has rules. And all rules can be changed. And all that matters is whether or not people follow the rules when they play the game or not. And what's happening right now on the global financial scale is we're proposing a new set of rules. There's a group of people who have said, we don't like the old rules, we think they're imaginary anyway. We're proposing a new set of rules. What would you like to do with that? Now, in game theory, there are several responses you can uh, you know, put to that question. So imagine you're a, a grandmaster chess, for example, and one day you find yourself opposite the table from somebody who says, look, I would like to play chess with you, but I'm going to move my pawns like queens. So you can move your pawns like queens too. You'd probably have a better game that way, but I'm going to do that. Now, you can either refuse to play and go, no, sir, this is not chess, and basically rage quit and just refuse to play the game. That's fine. Or you can be obstinate and say, well, I'm just going to carry on playing by the old rules, right? My pawns are going to move one square at a time, and if they can avoid the bishops and get to the other side of the board, they'll become queens, and we're going to do that, all right? <laughs> um, chess is a strange game. Nobody ever gets that joke. Uh, but, <laughs> but those are your choices. 
play by the old rules and see how you do against the new rules, adopt the new rules, or rage quit. And we have a critical mass of people who are playing by a new set of rules right now, who like those rules very much, and are being met by those various responses in the market. We have a lot of people, and fantastically we have government here today, who have clearly done a lot of homework and who actually get this stuff, which I've spoken to a lot of politicians around the world, that's not very common, so I must commend you all on your knowledge of the blockchain and, and what it presents to the world. Um, but we have these various responses to the set of rules that was predicted for just about as long as we've had the internet. Now, we don't have time to get into the information science behind distributed systems and how decentralization is an inevitability. The moment you are talking about information processing in anything from gossip circles to you name it, any human activity, where there's information flowing, it tends to decentralization. It always starts out in a centralized way, like the internet did when CompuServe and AOL were the only service providers in the States. And if you were a CompuServe um, client in the early days, for example, you could only email other CompuServe clients. You could not email somebody on AOL. It was that centralized, right? It always tends towards decentralization. So information scientists, people who understood this dynamic of information, wanting to be free, not in cost, but in the way it flows and roots, predicted what was going to happen. Milton Friedman said it in 1999. He said he thought the internet is going to be one of the major forces for reducing the role of government. The one thing that's missing, but, that, be, well, but that will soon be developed, is a reliable e-cash, a method whereby on the internet you can transfer funds from A to B without A knowing B or B knowing A. We knew this was going to happen. We knew these rules would have to emerge the moment we had a pro set of protocols that brought together a network like the internet that started eroding these notions of borders and the flow of information between them. And so what does that rule book look like? If you haven't read the Satoshi Nakamoto white paper, and I assume most of you have, I suggest you go back to it. Because it is a hot knife through the butter that you will find on Twitter about people pretending to know what Satoshi meant. He was not very ambiguous in the title of his white paper that said Bitcoin was a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. Gee, what was he trying to do? Maybe he had a really inefficient database to revolutionize your supply chain management system. That was what he was trying to do. No, he was not trying to help us put lettuce into an inefficient database, which is what Walmart has done. He had suggested a new system for cash, money baby, and Bitcoin is right on the money. In fact, in the world of blockchain, it's the only on the money idea we've had so far. Now, I'm not dissing all the other things we're trying to do with the blockchain. I will say that if you have a centralized, thir trusted third party, you don't need a blockchain, right? Go and use DynamoDB. It's very good. Just get a good database with sufficient encryption. It's faster. It's more efficient because you don't need proof of work. Proof of work was designed to facilitate networks where there isn't a trusted central authority. So you have a trusted central authority, don't need a blockchain. Don't have a trusted central authority, you need a blockchain. But everything else is up for debate, right? Maybe it is a good idea to put lettuce on the blockchain. Maybe we could do title deeds this way. Maybe people do want to breed cats. If you haven't played Crypto Kitties yet, I highly recommend it. But none of these things have proven themselves in the mainstream yet. There are interesting pilot projects. There are fantastic sandbox projects. None of them have suggested that they have a meaningful impact to make on the mainstream yet. The only one that has done anything significant to date is Bitcoin. Unfortunately, because people wanted to buy it to get rich in the hype cycle of 2017. But we know after 10 years of Bitcoin being around that it is rock solid, that its blockchain is unhackable, that people do consider it to be a good store of value, even if that number of people is small, you know, proportionate to the rest of the world. But it's the only good application of blockchain that we have so far. Satoshi also wasn't messing around with his intentions when he came up with a set of rules. In the Coinbase of the very first blockchain transaction, where Satoshi Nakamoto sent some Bitcoin to Hal Finney, who unfortunately passed away in 2013, in the Coinbase of that transaction, encoded into it, was the headline from the Times newspaper from the 3rd of January 2009, when the Chancellor was on the brink of a second bailout for banks in England. Satoshi was unambiguous in why he created the blockchain, why he created Bitcoin, and who he was targeting with this new innovation. 
Because in 2009, we were presented with yet again another example of how our global financial system fails, especially the poorest of the poor, when the houses of cards that it relies on come tumbling down. So, not despondent about where we're going with the blockchain. Love all of the experiments and the Cambrian explosion that have been happening around it. But we still have a very long way to go. Anybody predicting where this is going and showing you graphs with data about, you know, ledgers on the blockchain, these are all fantastic notions, interesting predictions, but, you know, pretty meaningless given how nascent things are right now. You can make any data look interesting using a graph. I am out of time, but I'm just going to spend two minutes going through some that are interesting to me, right? So in 2017, thereabouts, uh, when Bitcoin hit an all-time high in its market cap, we saw graphs like this coming out, comparing it to the market caps of companies. Meaningless data because Bitcoin isn't a company, of course. So I'm going to skip right over that one and start comparing Bitcoin to the things that it was designed to replace. If you look at global monetary supply, and there's some debate about how much money there is actually in the world, but let's call it $95 trillion. And if you even look at the amount of gold in the world, and we see those two things as things that Bitcoin is tackling in terms of solving the same problems, then it really hasn't even started. In fact, that little orange line I made on this graph was just for fun, so you'd have something to look at. It doesn't even register, right? So at its peak, the market cap of Bitcoin was nowhere near the value that we store in gold in the world, and it wasn't even a tiny dent on the side of global monetary supply. It hasn't even started yet, which makes it even more ridiculous that we had some people comparing it to the, to the, um, to, to the, uh, the dot-com bubble burst of, of 99 and 2000, right? At its very height, the entire market cap of cryptocurrency was infinitesimally small compared to what had happened in the dot-com era before that bubble burst. It's a ridiculous comparison, firstly, because these two things aren't really that related. It's a little bit like the chart of declining numbers of pirates in the world versus global warming. <laughs> um, but it is interesting to think about, because that was the headline, right? We've seen this before, it's happening again, this bubble has burst. No, baby, we haven't even started. This is the most important graph, though. This is the time to the next halving in the Bitcoin network. So a halving event is when the awards that are given to Bitcoin miners is halved. It's currently 12 and a half Bitcoin per block. It's going to halve next year. Now, if you look at this, uh, this graph over here, the, the, the axis on the left is price. We've got time at the bottom. And the color of the bubble is months until the next halving. And we're a little bit past the end of the graph now. But it is quite interesting when you see an algorithm that's governing supply, and we make some assumptions about demand, how predictable this whole thing becomes, right? I expect, and I'm, this is bad news for any of you hoping to return to the bull market in 2019, that until we get through that halving, and in fact it'll be a few months after that, we are not going to see anything but sideways shifts in this market. Yes, there will be spikes and dips, and you know, we'll have rallies here and there. But if we're going to stay fixated on price, we're going to have a very boring year. That's only going to get exciting again towards the end of next year, I'd expect. Rather than that, let's think about this one big success story that we have in the cryptocurrency game so far. And the fact that it is only 10 years old. If you look at the internet by comparison, TCP came out into the market in 1983. That's the protocol that enabled the internet. Ten years later, in 1993, the internet was only pretty much being used at universities by nerds dialing into bulletin boards, and HTTP, which is the protocol that enables the World Wide Web, was only starting to dribble into the market. It was nowhere near mainstream adoption, despite what some have said on Twitter, ten years into its life. So we have to appreciate the fact that it's early days, right? We also have to appreciate the fact that, like the internet, we need to find ways to scale Bitcoin. So, skipping through to my last slide, that's the most interesting thing happening in cryptocurrency for me at the moment that I want to leave you with. Is now 10 years after we've, we've seen the birth of Bitcoin, 
as what started happening with TCP and the internet 10 years later, we're starting to scale this network the only way you can scale information networks, which is through protocols. And the most significant protocol we're using to scale Bitcoin is the Lightning Network. There are today 10 times more Lightning nodes than there were this time last year. It's absolutely exploding. The, net, the Bitcoin network itself has more hash rate today than it has at any point in its history. So that's another untold part of the story of Bitcoin over the last year. Is but despite a, what they call a crypto winter and a terrible bear market, the network has actually grown. There's more mining activity. There are more nodes. Bitcoin is growing. It's stronger than ever. It's more trustable than ever. And it's about to take a leap into the next phase of mainstream adoption because we're going to have a protocol for medium of exchange and microtransactions. And when you look at what's happening in the lap space, people building applications on top of Lightning, um, one has to be pretty excited. So, I had more I wanted to share with you, but let me leave me with that thought. We are technologists, we're thought leaders, some of us are government leaders, right? We are forging ahead into the space, which requires a lot of faith because the world has lost a lot of faith in us. We know what's technologically possible, but it doesn't matter. Because we cannot have that conversation with people, that is not how we will draw them to our movement. What we need to be doing is telling those human stories about what is being done in Venezuela to hedge against currency decline, right? Or, or utter collapse in the case of Venezuela. How people are yet ready using Bitcoin to remit to Africa when they're working far away from home. There are good stories to be tell, told and better ones that are in development right now, but we need to keep the focus on that story, which until now has pretty much only been about Bitcoin, but I'm hoping to hear uh, other good ones coming out as I engage with you today. So thanks for listening to me. Sorry for going a little bit over, and that's me.